<clears throat> Thanks, uh, Marcel. Right. Hello, everyone. Very nice to be here. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, briefly, um, about the origin and the emergence of, of COVID-19. And this, as you be, were, are well aware, this has become increasingly um, contentious. And um, there's now, unfortunately, a whole set of, a subculture of, of, of conspiracy theories going on. I just want to give you a, a one slide overview of my life in the last week to kind of put some context. So on, um, on Monday, there was a wonderful article, wonderful, in the Daily Telegraph, suggesting that um, my own work was being directly funded by the Chinese Red Army. And to, um, and to, to, to get that, that was it, what they call it there, this explosive revelation, they actually read the acknowledgements and worked out one of the authors had done such um, awful things as genetic sequencing and virus isolation. What they didn't really emphasize was that this paper was about pangolins. So unless the Chinese military interested in making sort of stealth pangolins for covert operations, I can't really see why they're particularly interested. However, it has then stimulated a whole bunch of me getting some very strange emails. Some of it's actually just downright nasty. I'm going to apologize for this, but I think you want to kind of see what the world is like at the moment. So this is, this is one I got um, on Tuesday or, or so, which I'm sure you can read for yourself. Um, I assume that the person who wrote this, his mother, helped him with the spelling. Um, yesterday, I got some even more fascinating. I've had just torrents of this now, just torrents. One, one really took my interest yesterday, um, and it's, it's going to discuss, it refers to another paper I'll discuss in a second, written by a co-author and myself, Wei, Wei Feng Shi, about some another small bat viruses. And it says here, the opening line is, I advise you to dispose of your RNA and autoplay, keep things quiet. And why that was interesting is rather than being the, the Chinese military, this person claimed to be a Colonel, Colonel Potemkin from the Russian main intelligence directorate. So I thought this was interesting. And after this main email telling me what, how to dispose of samples, there's a huge, great list of PSs. Um, almost at the bottom of the PSs, he, this, he claimed, did, did the Colonel, that um, the GRU, that's the Russian Secret Service, have a, have a cure for COVID-19. And you can read about this there that, while we in, we in Australia and the US have been stocking up toilet paper, the, um, the, the Russian intelligence have been making this cure for, for COVID-19. But my suspicions about the identity of, of Colonel Potemkin were actually then really magnified by his final comment in, in his email chain, the final PS, about this, and particularly about this cure. And he, and he says, Don't get Peter Dutton. So I suspect, in fact, that the colonel was, in fact, probably someone living in, in his mother's basement in Rooty Hill, rather than being a member of the Russian intelligence. But so this is the kind of world that we're in now. It's very, very striking. And of course, rather than being anything nefarious, what, what has really happened here with, with COVID-19 is just another example of a, 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 a virus that's jumped from an animal into humans in this process of disease emergence now we're all very familiar with. And you can go on the web, we've been many years, I've been doing this for 30 or so years now. You can go on the web and you can find lots of examples of, of, of these viruses, particularly viruses of bacteria that have jumped, you know, from one species to another. And in recent years, we've had Zika, Ebola. In, in, in Australia, also, yeah, we've got things like Hendra, Nipahs nearby. And SARS-CoV-2, like SARS-CoV-1 back in 2003, is another example of that. A lot of work that I do, and I'll just mention it very briefly kind of in this context today, is, is trying to understand how viruses and adapt to spread in, in, in new hosts. And a, bit, and a bigger question, which I really haven't got time to deal with, but why is it that some viruses are better able to do it than others? And it turns out, for reasons that are not quite clear yet, that coronaviruses are just really good at jumping host species boundaries. Maybe they, maybe they use conserved receptors, it's really not quite sure. And so a lot of the work that I have done in recent years is just is, is set within this thing called molecular epidemiology or genomic, genomic epidemiology and that's using genomic tools to really understand and track outbreaks. I guess that's why we're all, all here today and a few years ago a number of us wrote a little paper in Nature Microbiology it was just describing some of these genomic tools you can use to understand these outbreaks and you can think of them in different kind of stages so initially you want to find out using genomics what is the pathogen and I'm going to focus on that today 
If you're lucky, of course, your sick person coughs directly over a PCR machine, but normally haven't got that, so you actually go and go to a bit more work. Then you want to find out, um, once you have the pathogen, what it's most closely related to. I'll discuss that today. Here I've got, like, for example, a duck virus. Then you, know, then you might want to try and track chains of transmission through population. That's kind of what we're doing in Australia a lot now. And of course, sadly, this particular virus has gone global. And so we want to try and, and I guess some people will discuss that later on, look at the kind of global spread of, of that pan, of that virus, sorry. And what I tend to do is focus mainly on the kind of first two bits of this. And the way we've traditionally done this is to go out and sample um, what I like to think of as fault lines in emergence, so using a kind of earthquake analogy. So bits where the fault lines are where humans and animals in, and interact. And because of they interact in, in, those, in these spaces, viruses and other things can pass between them. So they're kind of places where zoonoses, emergence events, can occur. So you, you imagine the natural world here and humans and animals can interact in, in, in livestock or companion animals, or increasingly we encroach on the animal world. We cut, you know, cut deforestation, those sorts of things. We have wet markets. And they, they, those are the fault lines. And we kind of sample at those places, normally animals, to see what's there and what might emerge. So for example, this involves very famously, and you'll see why I'm just showing this, going into, into caves to look for bats and their viruses. The picture of me in a bat cave in China in 2013 or so. My wife says that looks an improvement. And in doing that particular sampling, this is actually in Zhejiang province in China, not, not very close to Wuhan. But we discovered a whole bunch of coronaviruses. Um, one we discovered here called, you can't really see it very well, sorry, the tree is very small, called Longquan 140, from a place called Longquan in Zhejiang. It's actually pretty close to the one that's emerged. So these bats, as you'll see in a second, carry lots of these coronaviruses. So that's a kind of the general framework. And of course, and then, and then once we have a sample, the way we have been um, analyzing those data, and this will be important, and we'll discuss COVID-19 in a second, is basically using what we call metatranscriptomics, which is simply shotgun RNA sequencing. So we just basically take a sample, do an RNA depletion step, and then just do total RNA sequencing and use bioinformatics to kind of work out what's there. Quite very simple. Um, and the, the beauty of this technique is that eventually, We'll be able to do this kind of metagenomic analysis to find pathogens within a kind of 24 hour period. It's, it's not quite there yet. This is a kind of uh, you know, hopeful time frame for how it could be done. We're still taking a few days at the moment. It took a few days to find the virus that caused COVID 19, but eventually we went down to this kind of really quick pathogen identification. So, on to COVID 19 itself. So myself and my colleagues in China particularly were involved in some of the earlier studies. I was on a few of the earlier papers. And we, we were looking at patients infected um, in mid, mid late two th uh, December two, last year. And once we discovered the virus using that sequencing technology discussed, it was pretty clear that the virus was a coronavirus, okay? And not only was it a coronavirus, but it was a beta coronavirus. So coronaviruses are in different genera. This was in the beta coronavirus. And within that beta coronavirus genus, it was actually pretty close to um, the first SARS virus. So up there, you can see that's the original SARS virus that emerged in 2002, 2003. This is the one we've got here. Initially, it was called 2019 NCOV. Now it's SARS-CoV-2. There it is. And it was pretty closely related to some of the other, um, other human ones, particularly MERS. The MERS virus emerged in 2015. It's still around. And there's another one, another couple here, particularly um, uh, HKU24, another human virus. There's a few, there's a few human viruses and a few nasty ones. But what the key thing is, I think, that, that, that we can see is the ones in, the viruses in black, the sequences in black, they're all from bats. So we knew very early on this was a coronavirus, a bit of coronavirus that, had, that was pretty close to the first one, about 20% divergent, and very close to this massive reservoir of bat viruses. And I'll come back to bats in a second. I and mean, what you also heard a lot of is that the first cases, not all of them, and this is important, but many of them, were linked to this particular um, fish and wildlife market in Wuhan City. And I've been to this market. I was there a few years ago. I took some photographs. I'll show you some of those now. And, it, and the word fish is kind of, you know, a little bit um, hopeful. In fact, it contains lots of different wildlife, as these wet markets often do. This is a kind of photograph as you go in. It's, kind of, it's basically a set of like, little alleys with, with a you know, covered roof. Um, and there are there's a whole diversity of things in there. There's, here are some, 
Here are some rodents. I'm not entirely sure what they are. Maya rabbit's online, maybe she'll know, but these are some sort of rodent species. And this is a raccoon dog. Um, very strange looking carnivals. They look kind of guilty to me. But there are a whole bunch of these animals in there. And they took me, I was taken to this market a few years ago because the local CDC said, look at this place. It's an accident waiting to happen. We think a virus could emerge there. And you know, that may well have happened. We can't yet prove it's from the market, but it's, if not, it's a pretty amazing coincidence. Um, so when the virus was then discovered, what was, pretty, what was interesting, it was a, you know, a, a pretty obvious coronavirus, same sort of structure, long polymerase gene there. And the spike proteins that is the glycoprotein that interacts with the host cell. And what was, what was immediately interesting is although the structure was pretty simple, in the spike, sorry it's a bit small, but in the spike protein sequence, there's a, there's a there, the spike protein two, two subunits called S1, S2. And where they meet at their, at their junction site, there was an insertion of four polybatic amino acids. And that's called a furring cleavage site because the protease furring can act on it. And that was unusual because it wasn't, it was, although it was found in other coronaviruses, it wasn't found in any that were really close to this one. So that was kind of unusual. It's caused a lot of kind of debate of where this furin site um, comes from, cleaver site comes from. Very interesting, it's a really nice thing on, on, on the website of Virology called by Bill Gallagher. And Bill Gallagher has shown that that particular furin and cleaver site there um, in SARS-CoV-2 is actually, the sequence is very closely related to another coronavirus that's found in a, in a bat and they're actually, and, he 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 shows it actually um, um, a polymerase site. So this could easily be that these two viruses got into a bat ancestor, and there's been a what's called a copy choice replication that's produced that sequence in in in, in the SARS-CoV. So it looks like as a you can, you can envision a very simple genomic replication mechanism that makes that rather unusual for insight in bats. So it's kind of interesting. Um, now, so the, and the bat the virus that most people have been interested in. Is this uh, bat host being the interesting thing? Is this thing called is this horseshoe bat here? And these horseshoe bats are very common in parts of China and they carry lots of coronaviruses, including relatives of SARS CoV 2. And if you kind of blow up the tree a bit, a bit more, what you see is this is the same tree before, but a bit magnified. Over here, these are the human strains. And that one there, RATG13, that's the closest relative of the human virus. And it's from, it's from one of these horseshoe bats. So that one is the closest one. What was really striking though, um, is not only bats and humans carry these viruses, but the ones in red dots. Amazingly, these are from pangolin. The pangolins are these bizarre nocturnal solitary animals that are horrendously endangered to the wildlife trade. And bizarrely, they carry two groups of, of coronaviruses that are very closely related to the human one. Um, and even more strikingly, in the receptor binding domain, that's the bit of the virus actually binds onto the host cell receptor, the ACE2 receptor, the pangolin sequence is actually almost identical to human thing. So somehow in the evolutionary history of this virus, where it's got into humans, pangolins are involved. I don't think they're the direct ancestor, the direct intermediate host, but there's something the virus has gone through a pangolin. And the key thing at the moment is we're still not entirely sure what the host of this virus is. It's not quite clear what the, what the species is. Although bats are close, pangolins are close, the closest virus is still about 50 years evolutionary divergence. So that branch there, from that bat one to the human, looks very, very short. In fact, in there, because viruses evolve very quickly, that's about 50 years or so of evolution. So there's a big gap in there that we're missing stuff. Um, and it's just very recently, one other virus has been, has been um, um, published. This is what that Russian intelligence agency from Western City was talking about. It's called RMYNO2 and that was also found in a horseshoe bat in Yunnan province in 2019 and it's very interesting for two reasons. One, in the polymerase gene, the 1AB gene, that along with the genome there, it's the closest relative of SARS-CoV-2. So there is. Um, and when I say closest, it's, it's closer than RATG13 but it's still actually at least 30 years divergent. So it's the closest in this region. The other part of the genome is recombined, it's a bit more divergent, but here it's the closest one, but still some way distant. Okay, we haven't got the ancestor. And it all, and very strikingly also has um, a, a, an insertion at the S1, S2 cleavage site. Not the same insertion as found in SARS-CoV-2, but a similar sort of thing. Just showing these things can happen in nature. How long have we got left, Marcel? Is this about right? 
Uh, yeah, you've got another couple of more minutes. Okay, right. So that's uh, so that so that just I'm oh, almost there. So that kind of gives you a kind of a, a, a overview on on the origin as we know it at the moment. I can, again, the key thing is we still have this evolutionary gap between the closest relative viruses to the human one um, and the, the animal one. So what's in there? And I suspect there's a whole whole set of animal coronaviruses in bats and other mammals we are yet to sample. Our sampling is so small of the virus sphere in these animals. So watch this space, hopefully more will come. And finally, I just wanna say that, you know, that's China. It's, we, we do find these viruses in lots of other countries too, in wildlife. So I'll just zip through this. In Australia, for example, we've been looking at marsupials. We found, this is in trees here, we found in things like koalas and bandicoots, um, we've also we found relative hepatitis C virus in these animals. We've recently found tularemia, not a virus, a bacterium, in possums. Um, even more dramatically, I'm doing some work with some people in, in uh, the kids' hospital in Sydney. We're looking at children who are diagnosed with encephalitis of unknown cause. Okay, so we do our metagenomic approach on, we have, here are the kids here, these are different places, they have blood samples, urine samples, whatever, CSF samples. And you find a whole bunch of viruses that you didn't know were there. And there's some coronaviruses, a rhinovirus, et cetera. And you can do evolutionary trees. But what's so interesting, in one of the, one of the children um, from Western Australia, they had in, the, in, the, in, the, in this sample from this child who was ill with encephalitis, a virus in red that's hepatovirus that's not a human virus. It appears to be most closely related to viruses found in other mammalian populations. So the, the human ones are here, this red one, nowhere near the human. So here we're seeing a spillover event in Australia causing disease in a child. Okay, so these are the spillover events occur naturally and I think one of them has led to SARS-CoV-2 to COVID-19 although we're still missing kind of we have gaps in our understanding. So I think I'm just going to leave it there. Obviously lots of people do the work. I particularly just like here the list of people I won't go into but he'd like to um, acknowledge I do lots of work in, in, in China and Dr. Professor Zhang particularly is the kind of key guy who drives this and he took me in 2016 to the Wuhan Central so that's my kind of shiny head there. He took me to that's Dr. Zhang. He took me to the Wuhan Central Hospital, and, and this is this is the respiratory diseases ward um, a few years ago. And you can see how kind of calm and clean it is. I can only imagine what it was like in January of this year. But um, these are these, these 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 people are heroes. It's an amazing job trying to understand this outbreak. I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs>